Hello and welcome back to my channel. This video is going to be about my experience at Marine Corps Officer Candidate School. If you are a returning subscriber, welcome back. If you are new to the channel, uh, this is a channel where I document my personal, intellectual, and professional journey uh, here on YouTube. And uh, most recently, I, I have completed Marine Corps Officer Candidate School. And so this video, I'm just going to be kind of talking about my experience. And the goal of this video is, you know, hopefully to provide just some insight to people who may be shipping out to Officer Candidate School. I just completed class 244. And so the class 245 is probably gearing up to head out uh, in January. Maybe you're someone who is not headed to Officer Candidate School, but you just want to learn a little bit more about uh, what it's like um, at Officer Candidate School. And so this, we'll jump right into it. So Officer Candidate School is broken down into five phases. And the, the goal of Officer Candidate School is to screen evaluate candidates for their potential to uh, become Marine Corps officers. Uh, I arrived at Officer Candidate School on September 9th, 2023. This day will forever be ingrained in my memory for many reasons, but uh, the first is, so I drove from Oklahoma to Officer Candidate School. You can, uh, you can drive, you can bring your personal personal own vehicle, or, you know, a lot of people will fly in. Your experience arriving at Officer Candidate School will be different based off if you fly or if you drive. What I remember is, I remember just kind of calling uh, my family, uh, my fiance, and saying like my goodbyes to everyone, because I knew that when I got there, that, you know, my life, they were going to take my phone and I wouldn't be able to talk to people for a little while. I had people, like, I just remember that like while driving in, I didn't like think about how quickly uh, things were going to like kind of kick off if that makes sense. So like I remember like I pulled in, uh, you know, you drive onto Brownfield, like you have to go through the main gate and then you're like following these signs that are like this way to OCS and you're just following these signs and then you get onto Brownfield and you have to go through another gate, you know, and you're just, like showing your orders and your ID and you're, you're dressed in your candidate camis as we call it. And as I was driving down the sort of the back side of the parade deck to the parking lot, you know, there's Marines and they're like telling you which way to go. And I get into the parking lot. I remember I parked my car and like a Marine comes up to my window and like I, I roll it down and he's like, do it again. And I was just like, what? He's like, park again. You're parked crooked. Do it again. And I was just like, okay, yes, I'll park again. So I back up my car and like pull up, you know, more straight. And I just remember being like, okay, like not the greeting I was thinking I was going to get. But then I remember they were like, okay, get out of your car, get your stuff, get your bags and, and get in line over there. And I'm, you know, getting out my car, getting my stuff. And the first thing they're just like is hurry up, hurry up. You're going too slow. And it's hot outside and I'm sweating and I'm dressed like a dork. And I'm like trying to hurry up and get my bags and like make sure I don't forget anything, make sure I have all my stuff. And then they just start yelling, hurry up, hurry up. And I was just like, oh, all right, all right. I'm going too slow. I'm going too slow. So I like trudge over to get into this line and there's all these candidates just lined up, just single file, like looking straight ahead. They don't have like the, the footprints like they have at boot camp. We're all standing there. And once there's like a pretty good amount of us, they walk us to the, the dorms, the barracks where we're going to stay, Graham Hall. And we start walking there and my bag is actually really heavy. Like I had brought a lot of stuff. And so I'm like actually kind of struggling to like carry this bag. And once we get to sort of the check-in station, you know, we're standing there in line and I, I thought that like we had kind of, you know, we'd arrived at our destination. So I put my bag down on the ground because it was heavy. And the first thing is this, this female gunnery sergeant just comes up into my face. She's like, you have your bag on my parade deck. Did I tell you you can put your bag on my parade deck? Get Pick up the bag. So I was just like, oh, oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Like picked up my bag. I'm not a ma'am. I'm a gunnery sergeant. And I was like, okay. So that was the beginning, and that was my welcome to OCS. So the first couple days of OCS are in processing. They're really not that bad. I mistakenly thought that this is how things were going to be because basically that day you're just, or for like the first couple days, you're going to medical, you're doing some paperwork, you're uh, just kind of making sure that you're good to go in terms of training, getting some gear issued to you. Some people do get dropped. Uh, during this time period like so I I had a, a shoulder a previous shoulder injury um, That I had already been cleared for but I remember you go to medical just to like do another check and I got sent to 
the physical therapist, along with some other Marines. And the guy who was in front of me, you know, I'm thinking like this, I'm not really thinking they're going to send people home. He went and talked to the physical therapist and he got sent home that day. This was like day two. So uh, if you have injuries and they think that these injuries are going to prevent you from training, they will send you home. So make sure that you arrive at Brownfield healthy. I was fortunate enough, you know, luckily I you know, sort of rehabbed myself and I didn't have any injuries that were going to keep me from training. But this during this time, like you're not really getting yelled at that much. There's kind of some, uh, there's staff that are like ushering you around Brownfield, but they're not really there to like, they're not there to screen and evaluate you quite yet. You haven't really been introduced to your platoon staff and, uh, you know, your your platoon sergeants and your uh, sergeant instructors yet. That will come around day four or five. And you'll know that things are starting because, one, you've done your initial PFT. So you have to get a, you know, a first class PFT or above. I think it's a 235. And then you will have a meeting with the colonel of OCS. And that day, I remember, like, we were all in Brown Hall. Uh, Yeckel Hall, I'm sorry. The colonel, like, comes and he gives this sort of, like, big speech about, one, how you have an opportunity here at OCS and that, you know, many great military leaders have come before you, have gone through this same program, and that things are going to be difficult and challenging, but they're meant to be difficult and challenging. And, you know, the purpose is to screen and evaluate people on Brownfield. And he says something that's really important, but he says that every breath you take on Brownfield is being evaluated. And I'll make a video uh, in the future where I kind of talk a little bit more about, you know, things I wish I knew before going to OCS uh, that I didn't know. Talk again about that quote in that video. That's for a future video. So if you guys are liking this type of content already, just make sure you like and subscribe. Uh, leave, throw a thumbs up because I'll be making more videos uh, talking about the Marine Corps, specifically Officer Candidate School. The colonel comes and he gives a speech. And this is, you know, basically the beginning of actual training. In the first or the second phase of training after in-processing is called transition phase. He says something along the lines of he tells you that things are going to be chaotic, but it's like an organized chaos that everything's like meticulously calculated. He departs you and he says, you know, I'll see you in 10 weeks. And truthfully, that's the last time you see the colonel uh, until graduation day. And then we were taken from Yeckel Hall and brought back to Graham Hall. And I remember they brought us into like one of the one on one of the floors. There was like it's, it was in the barracks and like there should have been, you know, like a, a beds and lockers in that room. But for some reason, it had been cleared out. We only used like a couple of the floors. And we're all sitting there. They introduced us to our platoon sergeants. And I mean, these guys come out and they are like the poster boy of the Marine Corps. Their uniforms are just super crisp. Um, they're mean looking. Uh, you know, a lot of tattoos. Um, and they're just not smiling and they're in perfect, you know, military formation, perfect marching, perfect step. Like everything is just super crisp. Everything is super tight. You hear the command, you know, and they say something along the lines like take charge of the platoon and carry out the, the, the plan of the day. And in that moment, training has begun. And I just remember they immediately just start yelling at everyone. Get up, get up, get up, run this way, run that way get up, you know, go back, go back. And everyone is just, you know, freaking out. Everyone's running and shoving and pushing each other. That is kind of just like how it stays during transition phase for about two weeks. During this time, you'll do a lot of like a physical, like you're running everywhere. And for me, it caused, you know, some, like it was, it was difficult because my knee was not as strong as I would have liked it to be going into OCS. You're having to do a lot of things like a uh, get down, like squat down Indian style and, you know, scuzz the ground with your scuzz brush. Um, you're having to do a lot of things like just like get down on one knee and like hold like these really difficult positions. I remember a, a, a story that I'll tell one candidate who dropped on day two. We're all standing in line and the whole part of this like transition phase is they're trying to wean people out and they want to see that you're able to sort of take the mental abuse and they want to see that you're going to be able to, you know, not give up. They will definitely try to get in your head. Like they are going to try and figure out what makes you tick. They're going to try to figure out like what your weak spots are. I remember they were calling one candidate just like this really big guy. They were calling him big for nothing. 
um, you know, telling him he was mentally weak. And, you know, a lot of people drop during this phase. You know, they, they talk about like that they don't target people. And I disagree with that. I think they absolutely do. I think they target people that they think like don't belong there or they think like wouldn't be good Marine Corps officers. I think they also target people based off of their like their contract. So specifically, I think like lawyers get it really bad compared to uh, some of the ground contracts. The whole point is for them to try to just mess with your head, because if you can't take, you know, these two, three weeks of just like the mental games, as I'll call it, then what's going to happen when you're actually in combat? Like you're probably not mentally suited. We're sitting in the, the dining hall, just a couple of ideas of how they'll play games with you. I remember the sergeant instructor went up to one guy and like asked him like, oh, where do you go to school and stuff like that? And he was you know, getting on to him for how he sat in the dining hall. And he was just like, oh, you're 23. Like at 23, I was in Iraq getting shot. Like, what are you, what have you done? Oh, you got a college degree. What did you major in? The guy was like, oh, I majored in sports exercise science or something like that. And he was like, yeah, I bet you're here because you have nothing else to do. Like you're, you're, you're dumb. Like you're worthless. Like da, da, da. They're going to get in your face. Like I remember one time, I was sitting in the dining hall and my fingers were spread like this instead of like this on my knee and I'm just eating and sergeant instructor comes over and he like yells at me. He's like, get your, get your fingers together. Get your fingers. He's like in my face. Right. And I, you know, I get my fingers together and I just keep eating and you know, I pick up my cup and I drink it and I put the cup down and the cup's supposed to be touching the tray. And he comes back over to me and he's like, this time he gets in my face and he's like, spitting yelling in my face um you know and he's like telling me like get your cup your cup's supposed to touch the tray da 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 and I tell this story just to say that like that's how you're going to be treated and truthfully it does get better but ultimately those sergeant instructors don't necessarily lit up on you um until about like week eight during that transition phase that's when you're going to get it the worst and basically they're wanting to see that you can take command, that you're not going to be rattled, that you'll, you know, just kind of maintain composure, bearing is what we call it, and that you'll like listen to the small rules because there's so many small rules at OCS. And the idea, I think, of having some of these small rules is to try to have you think about so many things because when it comes to leading Marines, like the smallest details matter. Like a one thing they'll do is, you know, you get these like lockers Everything is fast. Like the things are going so fast. And if you're moving slow, they'll just start counting down 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. And by the time they get to zero, like you have to be done moving. Um, so in that, that speed and in that chaos, you have to make sure your locker's locked. And if your locker's unlocked, they'll take your lock. They'll give you a chit, which is just like a, a write-up. Um, you might get assigned an essay. And they might take your lock and like, I remember one time they took a whole bunch of people's locks because like, like five people had left their lockers unlocked and they put all the locks together. And then like, you know, the candidates just had to figure out like, okay, which lock is mine? And so that took, you know, a little bit of time. And there's not much time because every moment at OCS, you're doing something, you're busy, you're on the go, you're either in class, you're doing drill. And that was the other thing too that I didn't know is like drill starts immediately. I think we started drilling like that, you know, the same day we met our sergeant instructors, we started, you know, learning how to drill. And you will drill so much at OCS. When you make uh, any move, you'll get into drill formation. You'll, you'll like be drilling while walking from the barracks to the classroom, from the classroom to the chow hall. You are always drilling. And so once you get out of transition phase, then you get to adaptation phase. And this is where you start being evaluated uh, more on your, your, your leadership. So billets will start to kick in. Uh, you as candidates will start to you know, play the role of company commander or candidate company commander, candidate company first sergeant, candidate company gunnery sergeant, you know, uh, platoon sergeant, platoon commander, uh, all these different billets. And you'll be evaluated on your ability to uh, do the duties of those billets. And my first billet was Canet Company First Sergeant, which is absolutely the hardest billet. I don't care what anyone says. It's the hardest billet, especially I, I was the first person to go. And so I think they chose me because I was a lawyer and because I was a little bit older and they like knew that this was a really hard billet. And I actually failed this billet. Uh, it was it was really difficult. 
um, as someone who had like no military background, like you're put in front of the entire company. It's your job to not only get counts of all the candidates, but also to like sort of move people from location to location and to uh, do the drill formation. I remember the first day that I went out there for drill formation. Everyone in the uh, company will remember that day because, I mean, I had like five sergeant instructors. They were all just surrounding me as I was like trying to, you know, do the formation. And every single step I made, like anything I was doing, it was it was all just wrong. And they were just blasting me like, go back, do it again, do it again. Oh, like, why is your button uh, pocket unbuttoned? Uh, you know, just anything they could find, they were nitpicking on me. And the next person to hold the billet after me was a female law contract. And so I do think they chose us because we were both older and we were both like law contracts. And truthfully, I don't think that although the Marines need lawyers, I don't think they necessarily like lawyers. I think that they would prefer to turn a Marine into a lawyer rather than turn a lawyer into a Marine. You know, the Marine Corps is, is like sort of like controlled and like it 80% of the Marine Corps, I think it might be more than that, is enlisted personnel. And I mean, they have a lot of like at OCS, a lot of control and power in like they call all the shots, really. And so I say all that just to say, if you are a law contract, know that they will have a special place for you in their heart and not necessarily in a good way. I, I, many, many uh, law contracts dropped within the first couple of weeks. And there were even law contracts that like failed, uh, you know, their leadership portion of OCS and they got dropped week nine, like, you know, a week before graduation, they got sent home. So if you are a law contract, know that it is very possible to make it through. Know that you probably will get some special love, but, um, you know, just make sure you are, you're hard, uh, you're humble and, you know, go there ready to perform because once you get to adaptation phase, you'll be expected to not only lead in billets, but also, you know, you'll start doing your small unit leadership evaluations. Um, and before that, your leadership reaction course. I'll also have some videos coming out about, you know, tips on how to pass a leadership reaction course and small unit leadership evaluation. Uh, essentially, you are being screened for your ability to, you know, think in chaotic situations to be able to handle stress and lead your peers, uh, at, at least at the leadership reaction course, you're, you're sort of just having to like overcome some obstacle, but in uh, the small unit leadership evaluation, you're having to first control a fire team and then control uh, a squad. So, you know, you move up to the squad leader role and your ability to communicate, uh, decide, act and communicate uh, in the fog of war, deliver a five paragraph order, uh, without missing any key elements. That's really the, the main things you're going to want to focus on during that time. Um, and then also just like making tactically sound decisions and, you know, really thinking like a military officer. They want to they wanna make sure that you actually have the ability to lead because every Marine is a rifleman and every Marine officer is a provisional platoon rifle commander. That's what you learn. Uh, that's what you become once you have graduated the basic school, which is where you go after officer candidate school. That phase is a lot more the same in terms of the sergeant instructors. You know, at that point, they're kind of thinking that any mistakes are like the small things you should have figured out by now. That's why you're, you've, you are to have adapted uh, by that point. After adaptation phase and sort of leading into the end of OCS, sort of around week six, week seven, is you get into what's known as decision-making phase. And this is when the sergeant instructors sort of like they take their like foot off the pedal a little bit and they kind of like really want to see that you as a platoon can take control and that you guys can, you know, carry out the plan of the day. And really, they only jump in whenever you like are super messing something up. They'll let you guys take the wheel and they'll see if you, you know, crash the train, if you will. You do get some more like freedoms during this time. So like your liberty, you'll get like weekend liberty. Um, I think that happens sort of around like week five. Um, but you're, uh, when you're in decision making phase, your liberty periods will kind of become a little bit more extended. So you'll get like, you know, 24 hours of, of liberty. Um, but know that those liberty periods, you are still being evaluated, right? Like they want to see, 
Are you going to take that liberty period and go do something like really dumb? I don't think that happened to anyone in, in my uh, company or yeah, that I know of, definitely not in my platoon. As you get past decision-making phase, the next phase is uh, out-processing and mentorship. And this is the phase in which you've kind of already completed all of your evaluations. You have a more or less a good knowledge of whether you're going to um, pass OCS. So there are, uh, I think there are like seven leadership tests. And then alongside leadership, you also have your academic test and your physical fitness test. And so if you're failing in any of those categories, you won't graduate. By the time you get to mentorship phase, you probably have a pretty good idea of whether you're making it out of there or not. By this time, your platoon should be kind of operating as like a well-oiled machine. Like everyone knows what they need to do. Platoon sergeants, they more or less know like that you will graduate and, and the sergeant instructors or whether you won't graduate. And so they really do start trying to just teach you those lessons that uh, their experience and their uh, wisdom from actually having been in the fleet for, you know, 12, 15, 20 years, uh, they start trying to impart that on you and start trying to give you some guidance and some counseling. And so it's a, a really like special time of the period of instruction. Uh, this is the time in which our, you know, at least m my company, Delta Two, we were on our platoon and our platoon sergeant, uh, you know, he really started like opening up to us and like sharing stories with us about his experiences. And it was really cool just to, you know, hear about his journey, about why he ended up at OCS. Um, and you realize by this time that it wasn't personal, like any of the things that happened during OCS with your sergeant instructors and your platoon sergeant, you realize that for them, it's business, like it's a job. Um, they care a lot about the core. The other part of it is it's their job to screen and evaluate. And so nothing that really happens at OCS is personal in that, in that sense. Um, it is just, it's business. And, you know, our platoon, we started off with like 60 candidates and we graduated 40. Um, that was just my platoon. The entire battalion had 400 candidates and graduated 300. And so there is a pretty big, you know, dropout rate. So come ready, come prepared physically and mentally. Um, my biggest piece of advice for those who are headed out is make sure you know the rank structures, specifically the enlisted rank structure. And if you can find someone who's been to OCS before, maybe try to get your hands on a lights checklist and maybe um, also make sure you know how to uh, do proper reporting. Um, and if you really want to get ahead of the game, learn about E to O and uh, E to E formations. That would put you, you know, light years ahead, especially if you have no military experience. So thank you guys for watching. If you made it this far, I hope this video was informational, useful. Uh, leave any comments, any questions, anything that you think I should address in future videos. Uh, make sure you like, subscribe, smash that thumbs up button. And thank you guys for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.